thank you everybody. Thanks for having me. So I will call my four panelists. Jan has already done a fantastic intro. Thank you very much. One point I will complain about, you didn't mention the 1982 uh, entanglement uh, demonstration by Alain Aspe, who was my PhD advisor. That's something you're missing. He's a French, obviously. <laughs> Should have been on the slides with uh, just after Richard Feynman. Uh, Robert Marino from Qubit Pharmaceuticals. We've got Laura Schultz, where is she? From LRZ. And Philippe, Philippe, yeah, here too, uh, from McKinsey. Thank you very much. Alexander could not make it today, uh, but uh, I think we'll cover some of the points that he wanted to make. I just will start shamelessly making an introduction about myself and the way we will uh, work here is that each of the panelists, except Jan, who had already a half an hour uh, to talk about himself, will make a short intro about themselves and uh, what they're doing in the, in the quantum ecosystem. So here we're, should I do it? Yeah got my slides. Here we will approach um, the quantum ecosystem through the angle of Europe. And in short, and make it very concrete for you, uh, the question is, can Europe compete in quantum computing with the US and China? And also maybe, can Europe be back at the table of the leaders in digital technologies thanks to quantum? Uh, I think it's a good topic, uh, pretty hot obviously, and we'll see uh, what uh, what our distinguished panelists are thinking about that. And the other thing I'd like to bring also is when will quantum computing really have an impact on your lives? Uh, are there any applications that we will see within the next couple of years? Which ones? Uh, I think that's, everybody, that's something everybody wants to see as well. Okay, now trying again. <laughs> yeah, I have to go to the corner, really. Which way? It works where? Yeah. Here? <laughs> ah, okay. But it's not on the screen. Okay. Well, just again, starting about myself, I'm a physicist by training. I did my PhD. Uh, yeah, Jan was born already, actually, uh, when I did mine, but it was well, much earlier than him in the neutral atoms technology. At the time, nobody was thinking really seriously about applications of his technology. It was just basic science. Just quote unquote, I think of course it was important, but we are not talking really that much about application of, of quantum computing. And things have changed. I think maybe you don't realize that, but I think it was good to see in uh, Jan's slides, uh, things have changed pretty drastically. And the first thing uh, I want to mention is what I'm doing now. Uh, so I've not done much physics over the last years, but uh, since 2018, I've uh, started a fund investment vehicle called Quant Quantonation. We're investors in quantum technologies. We're the largest investor in the world, actually, in quantum technologies by number of lines of participations in, in startups in this space. And we had just announced a couple of days ago the closing of our fund, 91 million uh, early stage fund. Uh, we do only what's called series A, seed, pre-seed, or the other direction, pre-seed to series A. So the start of the life of our startups in this space. We have a very international uh, pool of what's called limited partners, so the people who give their us their money to invest in companies. And we have made 20 investments so far. We will do a few more out of this fund and then we'll think about something else. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. And something I'd like to show is that, so Jan told you already, his company created 180 jobs or 180 employees there. Uh, I think with our portfolio, we have, and I've not invested in Jan's company, although we have met a couple of years ago, very early actually. Uh, but uh, our portfolio has created more than 300 jobs over the last years. And I think that's fantastic that young physicists in particular, they have choice now to move to a company where they can directly use their skills uh, working on quantum technologies. Uh, now about the market and what I'm doing. Uh, this is, an, I think, an important slide. It shows you how much venture capital has put into quantum uh, over the years. Uh, we started in 2018, so we catch the wave really when it started. Uh, I think it was definitely the right timing. As you see, last year has been pretty uh, a record year uh, with um, 2 billion invested into the space. Uh, we'll not go into the details of SPACs and stuff like that, but yeah, 2 billion, that's a sizable number. Uh, most of it for uh, quantum computing, as you see. And this year will be a record year again. I'm pretty sure will be past 2 billion. But, yeah. No. 
But this is still a small number. People ask me all the time, overeating, are we not doing too much? But we're not doing too much at all. Two billion is very small for venture capital. If you look at this publication, that's about AI and machine learning. More than 100 billion has been invested in machine learning last year. Talk about two billion for quantum, still relatively small sector. If anything, we need more money. Uh, that's really the point here. And yep, next one is also pretty important for this panel. It shows the, uh, the, the split between Europe and North America. So essentially, most of the money is going to North America at this stage. Um, yeah, the 128 million, 38, 28, 28 million will make a difference uh, to it, uh, to it in 2022. But still, most of the money is going to uh, the US, essentially, and Canada. Um, I think one of the reasons, uh, personally, and that's something we can discuss later with the panelists, is that most of these companies have been created fairly recently. So 2018, 2019, when you look at this curve, that shows the year uh, startups in uh, quantum computing, quantum technologies have been created. Uh, as Jan showed you, 18, 19 important years. So the big rounds are coming. Like it's a good example for today, but I expect your, there will be bigger rounds in Europe and that will add to the statistics. So there's an effect of the yeah, relatively young age of the industry. And when you look at the numbers on how many companies have been created in Europe, I mean, if you sum all the companies in Europe, I think it's higher than in the US actually, and in, uh, in China for sure. So it's just startups and SMEs. One trick is that you include enabling technologies and you see that Europe is strong in that, not so much in, in the integrated quantum computing. I think that's a, that's a topic for discussion as well, but still in absolute numbers, it's not that bad, but it's going down. It's not very good. We need more companies to be created. We need a smoother curve, growing curve. And that's the reason why at uh, Quantum Nation, so we're working now on two funds, two initiatives. One on the left, which is a new fund called Quantum Opportunity Fund, which is dedicated to the scale-ups, so Series B and beyond, how to fund uh, companies once they have gone through the first years and they need hundreds of millions uh, of euros to, to grow and scale. And the second one is to feed in the pipeline of new companies. So it's a venture studio concept that we will be working on starting in September. So we are approaching the two problems that I see, more money for scale-ups and more companies at the beginning as well. And to finish, uh, give some tonality to our discussions, uh, I just copied this from uh, Sifted. It's a publication uh, from uh, BCG. I was a little bit angry about it, to be honest, because I think that's a little bit a symptom of the, what I call the Calimero syndrome. Uh, we're complaining all the time about what's going wrong. Actually, many things are going well in quantum in Europe. And really the idea about this panel is, I think, to show you that it's a dynamic ecosystem. And there's definitely a possibility for Europe to be among the leaders. Thank you. And now I will start with my first question for Jan, actually. Uh, no, at each stage, asking a question and giving you the opportunity to present each other. OK? Uh, so telling me, first, the question is about funding, maybe. Um, so you said, and that's a coincidence, I didn't know you would announce it today. I, I knew it was in the making, so that's why I wanted to, to ask the question. But do you think uh, being a European company has been a disadvantage for you over the years? Would, have, would you have done things differently? Uh, could you have done it faster? Uh, how do you consider yourselves with respect to competitors? Well, of course, it's always hard to say how it would have happened if it was outside of Europe, right? But I think what we see in Europe is a change of mindset. So I, I think people understand the problem and there is a will to change it. Um, of course, you cannot really change, let's say, the structure of European funds overnight and just say, okay, we make huge funds now and they can enable these funding rounds. This is, if you just look at the numbers of investors we have, we have quite a lot of them, uh, right? Because they do their, their ticket, whatever they, they can invest. And of course, maybe this creates a little overhead in managing them, but then I think, um, we also have a lot of opportunities um, in, in Europe because I think there is and there is an emerging and clearer and clearer strategy um, that uh, we say, okay, we don't have big corporations really building the, the system. So all the hope is on the startups. So what can we do to make sure that at least some of the startups scale and become significant players. And if you look at the plan, what has been done over the years, so for example, 2019, um, it was already um, the flagship, the quantum flagship ongoing with 1 billion euros funding, and now it will be continued. And the way people see it, there's 
from the flagship actually startups should be created. So take out the um, technology. And I think this is happening. If you look at the number of, of startups and where they are coming from, I think many of them come from labs which have been in the, in the flagship. And then the idea is actually, okay, help these startups grow through public procurement. And I think this is something we have done far too less in the past and maybe have done much better in the US. But if you now look at what is happening right now, actually, from the Euro HPC joint undertaking, there's an, in, and Laura can say much more about this, there's a uh, call open to equip certain European um, computing centers with, with quantum computers. So I think the willingness is there, the instruments are getting there. Also, if you look at the European Chips Act, quantum is uh, specifically mentioned there. Of course, now it's up to us to make something out of it. But I think we have at least especially for IQM, we have received so much support, so I cannot really complain. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll switch now to, to Robert. Um, so if you can share his presentation, I think I'm not sure it's the best way to do, but uh, yeah, so just a few minutes about who, what the company uh, is doing, about yourself, and then I have a, a question for you. Thanks, Christophe. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Robert. I'm the CEO of Qubit Pharmaceuticals. Qubit Pharmaceuticals is a drug discovery company. So the outcome of what we do are drug candidates that uh, will eventually go through preclinical and clinical trials and one day reach the market to cure major diseases. The way we do it is by using simulation and computation. So um, we do very little real experiment, but we compute everything. We have our internal uh, computational workflow so that we are able to reduce massively the number of experiment, the cost, the delays uh, before uh, reaching preclinical phases. Um, here I give you an example. Um, the company is very young, so we've been uh, incorporated in uh, in half of uh, 2020. Uh, at the time, we were only two people, and we grew up. Now we are about 20 people in France, in the US. Um, but early 2021, we decided to tackle the uh, development of novel inhibitors against COVID-19. Uh, that's a topic that we are still on, uh, both in terms of society and company. And uh, we wanted to see what we could bring thanks to our platform to this major issue. So we dedicated uh, what we had at the time, 50,000 euro and four people trying to develop novel IP, novel inhibitors that could go into the clinic. And um, thanks to the use of our algorithms, computing power, that we, we got support from the French National Supercomputing Facility, the GenC, uh, we were able to go very quickly into the discovery of two novel chemical families um, mixing simulation, AI, medicinal chemistry into our software. Um, that's usually for pharma that takes a couple of years and costs a couple of hundreds of million euros. So thanks to novel uh, algorithm, novel simulation tool, we're able to go very fast and bring something novel that can that is now continuing its development and, and hopefully soon going to clinical phases. Um, now the point is we are at the quantum panel, so what's the what's the link between what we do and, and quantum computing? The uh, ah, okay. So the first thing uh, I'd like just to go. So that's the, these that's, are some. That looks some, really bad. Really yeah, bad. I know that because these are the well, from the from the engineering team at, at Qubit. Um, that's the drug discovery process. So very often, and <laughs> I'm often angry about it when I see reports, people say, "Well, quantum computing for drug discovery—that's very easy. People are going to do." Uh, quantum chemistry on quantum computers. Uh, the first thing is that's completely false. Quantum chemistry is not drug discovery. It's one very small part of an entire pipeline. So you have some quantum chemistry here, you have some here, and you have some here. But we do many more than only quantum chemistry. You have to go through large databases of compounds, millions and millions and millions of virtual compounds. You have to solve optimization problem. You have to solve very complex uh, computer science problems. So how do I optimize a workload between GPUs, CPUs, and, and other types of machine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a full com and complex workflow, which is good news for quantum computers because if the only application of quantum computing was quantum chemistry, then there will be nothing before the next 25 to 30 years. Uh, and the fact that drug discovery is a complex process means that there are problems that we can solve now on quantum computers. So our strategy to using quantum computing is first, it's not going to be a standalone machine. It will be involved, it will be uh, embedded into a full high performance computing, quantum computing process. Um, so they have to work together hand in hand with current uh, HPC platforms. And I'm very happy that uh, there was the uh, Euro HPC undertaking because I don't think that, HP, that QC alone is, is going to be the way to the future. 
Um, second, we, we try to identify into a workflow complex mathematical problems. So not quantum chemistry problem, but math problem, computer science problem that would benefit a novel way of being computed. Because we can design drugs today with the existing uh, computers. We don't need quantum computers for that. But some operations are done poorly or not in an optimized manner or very expensive. And those are the types of problems that we try to find. And in these problems, we try to look at the bottlenecks. These bottlenecks should be small enough to be run on the current existing uh, com quantum computers and valuable enough so that they justify R&D investment and a change of infrastructure. And if I sum up, so basically, if you try to understand what is drug discovery, it's, it's as trying to land a robot on a comet. So it's very complex. You need to understand uh, the, and see exactly how the comet looks like, where, where are the landing spots, etc. So what we did at Qubit Pharmaceuticals with our platform Atlas was using more physics, we have now a clear view of, I'm going to, ah, well, yeah. we have a clear view of what are the targets, the protein, where we can land our chemical matter. That's the one of the COVID inhibitor that we have uh, that we have developed. Today it run on, on classic HPC platforms, and we hope that very soon we'll be able to use the uh, hybrid HPC QC platforms to go even faster and develop even better drugs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And for full disclosure, I'm an investor in Qubit Pharmaceuticals. They just raised 16 million in the lead round. Yeah. Went really well. Um, so you mentioned, and I know for a fact, you have uh, French and US founders in your company. So why did you do it in Europe and not in Boston, actually, where she's the mecca of biotech? I mean, it would have been easier, right? Um, well, the, we are opening, as you know, offices in Boston. So by the end of the year, we have our offices in a very nice place. Um, but it was very important for us to start here because, of course, clients are mostly in Boston. So even French companies, even French pharma do take decisions in, in the Boston area now, but the talents are here. So um, within Qubit, we have people that are in quantum chemistry, computational chemistry, HPC, computer science, math, physics, etc. And if you want to have the same amount of talent uh, working together in the U.S., well, that would have been first very complex because half of them are on the East Coast and the other half are on the, on the West Coast. So <laughs> difficult to, to find the best place to have uh, both of them. It would have cost five times more um, or even 10 times more. So also would have required a very large tech. And I'm not even sure there will be the equivalent talent pool. So clearly talents are here and that's the reason why we launched and, and continue to grow in Europe. Okay. And uh, side question, coming to my graph about the pipeline of new companies, just quick one, do you think we have what it takes in Europe to create new companies such as yours and a decent deal flow of such companies? Um, I think there are a lot of uh, very good labs um, in Europe that we can, that we sh that, that would be uh, in a position to spin off more companies. Um, I'm expecting more people to just yeah, leave labs and try to launch companies, even if they go back to the labs afterwards. Uh, but clearly, uh, it would be nice to have more people in the software, quantum software area. Um, that's what we miss today. Hardware is going well. Um, probably um, yeah, there will be a couple of new, new, new startups, but we need more people in the software area. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Laura, a very different perspective. Uh, can you tell us about your job at LRZ? I think, and sure. you have the clicker. Do you mind if I move a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Please do. So I can see my own slides. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, let's wait for that to pop up. Okay, here we go. So hello everyone, my name is Laura Schultz. I am Head of Strategic Development and Partnerships at Leibniz Supercomputing Center. I am also the Head of the Quantum Computing and Technologies Department. So I thought for my five minutes I would give you a really quick little tour of LRZ to kind of show you what we're doing and how it makes impact to this panel and the discussion that we're having today. So this is the Leibniz Supercomputing Center here on the front. There's some long buildings here, those are offices and visualization spaces, but what I'd like to draw your attention to here is on the left-hand side, this double cube environment. So this is our compute cube, our double compute cube, five floors. Uh, maybe. Here we go. On the fourth floor of our compute center is our big, large-scale HPC computers. This has taken a few years ago when it was fully stocked and fully filled. And what I want to direct your attention to is the back part of the picture where the lines are running horizontal. 
That was part of our super mook, our original super mook procurement. That was about 3.4 petaflops, and it took the entire space of one of the cubes. Up front, in the green with the green cables, that is our current SuperMOOC NG system. That has uh, 26.9 petaflops, and it takes a third of the space. Now, there, it's not just the size and the dimensions that I bring up, but I want to make a point about HPC. With all respect to the quantum community, uh, this, it is a, quantum is an absolute killer technology, and this is really going to transform how we compute. On the flip side, though, the actual HPC space is a rapidly evolving, very technologically advanced, ever increasing, ever evolving, ever advancing field in and of itself. And so when we talk about classical computing, that's kind of a name that came from the physics environment, not really the HPC community. So we're very advanced ourselves as well. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to point out is uh, with uh, the SuperMOOC at 3.4, SuperMOOC NG 26.9. Coming up soon, we're having an exascale class procurement uh, that we're working on now. And this is going to allow us, if you took out your calculators and did 3.4 plus 2.6, and you could do it within a second, congratulations. If you can do a billion, billion calculations in that one second, then you get exascale class bragging rights. So this is coming soon, and this is where it's going to start to get interesting for how we bring together uh, quantum and quantum acceleration in these systems. Okay, also in our building, a bit further down, is our new quantum integration center. So this was opened in 2019, and uh, we have a warm lab for non-cryogenic uh, technology. We also have an HPC testbed environment, and we also have a cold lab for cryogenic. Jan already showed you this picture. Uh, so this was last week when we had our 60th anniversary and we had our uh, uh, the, the state minister for science come and look at our uh, first cryostat. Okay, we focus really heavily on integrating quantum systems into HPC systems. We see quantum as an accelerator that is going to do amazing things with particular types of applications, and we're really looking forward to seeing this advance. We're looking forward to bringing it into the HPC environment. I'm gonna to try to redefine the term supercomputing to include quantum, to include next-gen AI, some really amazing stuff in that space, and to include the very heavily evolved HPC technology. But the idea is that we're working to bring all of this together in a smart way that truly advances our capabilities. So we are working to um, harden quantum computing technology, and we're working with IQM, uh, great partners with them, to really bring it into a data center to understand what it is we need to get done, what it is we need to do to make sure that we're able to use this. We're working to expand supercomputing to help make quantum acceleration part of this system. We have a lot of work to do in terms of scheduling, in terms of the operating systems, the compilers, there is a significant amount of work to do that we are starting on right now today to push that forward. And then lastly, the users enabling them. At the end of the day, the compute landscape is incredibly complex. So what we don't wanna do is make it even more complex. We wanna try to make it easier. We've got new HPC technology, we've got new AI technology, we've got new quantum technology, all of this coming together. We have to figure out how to make this as simple and approachable for the users as possible. So that's one of our directives at, uh, at LRZ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's rather, and uh, Jan alluded to it, I think it's rather, there's a simple question and, and something I've seen because we're investing all over the world, in the US, in Canada, elsewhere. I think something very unique in Europe is public procurement of yeah. quantum computers directly, buying machines, supercomputers, uh, supercomputing centers such as LRZ, uh, buying from, uh, from IQM and from others as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and why do you think that this is the right approach uh, and why uh, Europe is doing that actually and in what way that could help advance uh, the quantum ecosystem in Europe? Yeah, so I mean, the, the US quantum ecosystem is very, very strong. Let's, let's really give them that. Uh, very advanced, uh, they came out of the gate earlier, all right? And in the, in the national lab environment, for example, they're doing some really, really great advanced research work. 
Lawrence Berkeley uh, up in Chicago, uh, Oak Ridge. Um, very advanced, but what I think one of the differentiators is in the in the European ecosystem is the investment and already the forethought and the concentrated focus for putting quantum systems in HPC type centers. So as, as Jan alluded to, there's a procurement out from the Euro HPC um, joint undertaking purposely to put quantum systems into HPC centers, purposely to work on the integration to put them to, at the software level, at the physical level, the network level, and then also to train the workforce purposely to deal with both of those systems, to bring those two communities together and to achieve these goals. So that really is something unique, I think, for Europe very far in advance, which is wonderful for us because the moment we, off, we opened the Quantum Integration Center, that was our position from day one, that we see this as a quantum accelerator. We're going to put them into our systems. We're going to hook them up, and this is what we're actively doing today already with uh, the system that we have from IQM and testbed environment, and then we'll be expanding that into larger scale systems later on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think as an investor, I must say that's super important. Obviously, you imagine a company that you invest in all of a sudden. They have an, uh, an order uh, from, a, from a government uh, backed center. I mean, that's very credible. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's one thing, but it's also a customer. I think it makes a, a lot of a difference for a company to have customers uh, really early on. I think it's true for IQM, it's true for another portfolio company of mine, which is called Pascal. They have sold. Uh, neutral atoms based processors to France and Germany uh, and more will be coming in photonics in other technologies and I will just say now a few words about uh, Alex Gletzler he could not come uh, but uh, it's too bad because then we would have talked about alternatives to these nice chandeliers that you <laughs> both have on, on your decks. But that's not the only technology for uh, building quantum computers. You can do it with uh, atoms, uh, the case manipulated by light. So Alex is the CEO of Planck, uh, a new company out of Munich, uh, out of the Max Planck in Garching and uh, LMU, uh, born a few months ago. Uh, they did their... Uh, uh, first uh, fundraising, I think it's very promising technology also for Europe and he, he made the point I think he would he would have liked to say that this kind of technology is true probably also for IQM can be built in Europe. I mean on the supply chain side you can manage and deal with most of the components uh, so and in the current global environment obviously that's something important uh, politicians and governments are thinking heavily about. Okay now switching to, uh, to Philip, I think you don't have slides but uh, can you tell us a little bit about you work on quantum technology at McKinsey? Yes, very happy to. So good afternoon from my side as well. I'm Philip Ernst from McKinsey. And if you've expected now from a consultant that I'm coming with slide Excel and um, probably even a tie, then I have to disappoint you. So I'm a, a physics PhD by background. I did my work in neutral atoms and um, have joined McKinsey now um, more than 10 years ago, always focusing on innovation topics and specifically innovation in emerging tech. And I was very happy to see that quantum by now comes to a point where it's really closer to realization. And that's why we also within McKinsey are focused on this over the last two, three years, have assembled a group of roughly 50 people by now who's looking into this um, with different backgrounds um, from the different qubit technologies, from quantum information, et cetera, and also looking at the future of compute, by the way. And um, I personally am very much um, focused on applications, and this is also what, um, what's really inspiring me about, um, about the technology. So you've heard already that um, quantum can make a difference in um, specifically in chemistry applications and building on what, you, what you've said. I've, I've actually looked quite a bit at um, the sustainability space and how quantum could potentially affect this. And if you are looking at this in a, in a deeper level, you actually see that many of climate technologies are depending on advances in chemistry and um, on advances in material research. So if you are um, taking solar cells, if you're taking hydrogen, or um, even something like green ammonia, this could be, a, um, could be a big change. And to just go a bit deeper into this green ammonia topic, to give you a little bit of a feeling what this means. Nowadays, um, ammonia is produced um, uh, via Haber-Bosch process, high temperature, high pressure, using roughly 5% of global natural gas. And um, if you look at nature, though, um, there's a process which basically does this um, at room temperature and at atmospheric pressure. 
And um, we have not figured this out because we don't understand the chemistry well enough in order how to industrialize this. And if you can use quantum, um, a quantum computer to actually simulate that, to get down to this and get it, um, get it up to scale, that would obviously be um, a, a huge game changer because it would not only enable you to basically not use all that natural gas and have a have a better way to ammonia. If you think about it, you don't have to put all that energy in it. Um, suddenly becomes a lot cheaper, and you would have a way to an alternative fuel, for example, in the shipping industry, and thereby you could be able to decarbonize that industry. Um, as Jan also alluded earlier, right? These are things that are still out um, 10, 15 years in the future. But I strongly believe if you really have um, the chance of creating such disruptions, acceleration in the sustainability space by 10 to 20 years, then we almost have, um, uh, uh, from the ethical side, we, we have to think about this and have to see how we can make this possible and make it possible as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. I will have a, a follow-on question on that. Um, but one question for you. So it's often heard, uh, and I've seen that in reports in particular, that maybe quantum computing is the opportunity for Europe to be back uh, among, well, to create leaders in a digital technology, especially in hardware. We, it's rather clear we lost the CPU battle, the GPU battle. Uh, so will we win, or is there an opportunity to build a global leader out of Europe, who could really be uh, uh, among the top guys in the world? So I do believe this is an important opportunity, given uh, what I've just said before. And I think you've also heard um, uh, Laura and my fellow panelists talking about um, the, the challenges also of integration, solving this, how to, how to actually do this. So number one, having quantum hardware here giving us certain strategic autonomy. Number two, building the right kind of integration, right, which uh, will really require um, a significant intelligence to do this in an, in an optimal way. Um, I do believe is a very important point for Europe uh, because also of all the applications down the line, all of the value it will create uh, um, along the different sectors. For example, pharmaceuticals, right, um, that you really need to sort this out and I turn it around, I think based on what we've seen in CPUs and GPUs, I don't think we want to be as Europe on the same side of that coin again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think actually I will change a little bit the plans and give uh, the opportunity to the, to the public to ask questions. I think we can do that with microphones, I hope. Um, but maybe just one last question for you all. Uh, to, oh, yeah, it's... Crystal ball, a little bit, uh, I know. But horizon for applications. So we hear 10 years, 15 years, solving grand challenges uh, for better humanity, in a way. And I think that's noble and that's fine. But as an investor, I'd like things to happen a little bit faster as well. Uh, see some value from the investment, from the companies I'm investing in. Do you think there is a chance, an opportunity to have even incremental uh, advantages within, let's say, two, three years? with the machines that you're developing or you're working on uh, or the people, the customers you're talking to. And uh, just very quickly for each of you, maybe uh, a few words about uh, what you think is missing uh, in order for that to happen, if it is to happen indeed. I think that's a very good question. And as you said, a bit crystal ball, but um, personally what I've seen is um, and we have to go a bit into the technology here, that uh, um, around NISC applications so far, um, uh, there haven't been any um, uh, any proof points yet that you can really do something useful. So um, the real um, step change will be towards, uh, and when it's becoming truly disruptive, will probably be when it's become error corrected, so fault tolerant quantum computers. and. Um, if you, if you look at the roadmaps out there, um, this can be as fast as five years, um, uh, but um, I do believe it's probably happening within the next 10 at least. Okay. This is a little bit of a hard question for me to answer from uh, an HPC data perspective, um, but I already see the benefits. I already see, we, we just put in our first cryostat and we already have knowledge 
gain. We already have some discovery gain. We already have, uh, we're already thinking about theoretical constructs that we didn't actually even think about a year ago. So in terms of the amount of, of knowledge acquisition that we're already building, um, we're, that is just going to continue to in, in, improve. And um, I guess the other thing is I, I'm not so down on, on NISC. That's where we are right now. And there are several benefits to learn from this. There are applications that we can account for the noise that we can utilize that. And, you know, I think of things of like uncertainty quantification where there's a statistical washout anyway. There are capability, there are areas, there's a, there is a great deal of potential. I'm not an investor, and so I don't know where the mark is for what's considered success or not. But from our perspective, with uh, compute centers and the work that we're doing, we're already making headway, and we already have a clearer perspective of where we're going, and we're already asking better questions. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe also challenge a little bit this um, error correction um, hypothesis that it needs to be there. Um, yeah, I agree with you on that, and I compliment. So <laughs> you can you can go first. Um, of course, I agree that with error correction, a lot of things probably will be um, open up and, and happening. I think it's not that black and white. People are always ask, okay, how many years till it does it take until it works? And they think, okay, maybe there is a day, uh, April 13 uh, or so, and suddenly it works, right? This is not the case, but it's kind of a continuous improvement um, in a sense. Of course, we are um, building processors and we have certain generations and our processors grow. So there, this is maybe a little bit discrete, the jumps, but then it's also about a lot about the quality. So this is something that we constantly work on, how to control the qubits better, make be better gate implementation. So this so-called fidelity, bring it up. And then other people are working on the algorithm Right, and the question is, when do we meet, um, and when does it when does it start commercializing? I mean, already now there are certain physical problems, let's say dissipative phase transitions or whatever. Maybe people are not willing to pay money for it, but still, you can do very nice experiments on on such quantum systems that you cannot really do on, on classical computers. So I think it's a kind of continuous process, and we will see just more and more money flowing in over time. Okay. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, it's a continuous process, and we're not going to switch from classic computing to quantum computing in one day. So we have to integrate more uh, quantum on a, with the HPC infrastructure. Again, that's really my motto. Um, and I'm, I'm actually strongly against the vision that FT faltering quantum computing is going to save the world. It's, we never know when it's going to happen. We don't know even if it's feasible at, uh, at all because uh, we, we lack clues. And um, actually, if there are not that many applications of NISC, it's because there are not many people working on applications of NISC. So the more people invest in hardware, algorithmics, in uh, joint development, the more application will come. Uh, we should not kill NISC uh, today because we don't, I mean, we, we haven't found the killer application. It's, it's rather that it takes time. Uh, the first thing that was done was invest in hardware, which is logical, because if you want to do something, you need the hardware first. But meanwhile, more and more people are trying to find application in software. So it's going to, I think it's going in the right direction. And um, we are not going to solve the CO2 or whatever problems in one day with quantum computers, but partly improving the, each and every process in chemical, in finance, in whatever, it's going to yeah, occur every day, every month in the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And I must say, I was talking to, a, they're just adding my piece here, but I was talking to a customer of one of our portfolio companies and he was experimenting with the machine, with the real hardware and with the algorithm. And he just told me, I want to go into production this summer because it's as good as the algorithm I have at the moment. He didn't even wanted something much better, uh, like 10 times, 100 times, incrementally better was, was good enough. And with all the added advantages he saw in the technology, uh, I think could make sense. Well, in that case, I think it's going to be really, really hard to go into production, really, because the machine is just not completely available. Uh, but I think for me, that was pretty high opener. I think we I totally uh, am with you. I think we need to work on, uh, on these applications. And for those who don't know, so two categories of machines, FTQC, fault tolerant quantum computing, long-term error-corrected qubits, and short-term, the machines that we have now at IQM, at Pascal, at Planck, other uh, companies, they do what's called noisy intermediate state quantum computing, where you can mitigate the errors that are opening through algorithms, uh, smart schemes uh, on the hardware side with the controls, but you don't have a full error correction uh, implemented because that takes too many qubits in a way to correct uh, and to get one logical qubit. So uh, that's a different kind of system. You have a quantum system, you learn to, to do something with it and hope it's gonna be useful. Uh, as Jan said, you can simulate other quantum systems and that's good for science. Uh, and 
proof, proofs have been given already, but you can simulate very large systems. But in order to be universal in your computation, you will need fault tolerant at some point, whenever that happens. And I think that's a big question mark. Um, so now, uh, I think a, we have some time for questions. Uh, I think Jan gave a, a very good presentation as well. I think maybe an opportunity for, uh, for you guys um, to ask questions you you want um, to our to our panelists here. We covered applications, we covered technology. Um, yeah, I leave it open there. I don't know how that works with microphones, but I hope I can hear. If there's any question, you got a mic? Okay, here. Hi there. Hi, Christoph. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this fantastic panel. Um, I dare to ask two questions just because I saw that no one else was raising a hand. I know everyone hates more than one question, but the first one should be a rather straightforward number. Okay. Can you introduce yourself, I think? And yes, before the two questions, maybe a short disclaimer to myself, um, two disclaimers. The first one is that I've been working with the European Quantum Flagship, so Europe's uh, billion euro bet since 2016, since its launch on its strategy. and. The other disclaimer, I also work with a number of German and other national programs on, on their strategy in the quantum technology space. And uh, the question, the first one connects to this. That should be the easy one, the number, if you can say anything. Uh, you talked a lot about VCs and startups. You talked about public funding. But of course, there's a third major pillar, the companies that are heavily invested in the space, such as IBM, Google, Amazon from the US. Of course, there's Huawei and Tencent and others from China how this compares, because I think your benchmark, Christoph, was amazing with this uh, AI versus quantum, that it's almost like a hundredfold uh, investment in that space. Do you have any ballpark numbers uh, on the research, re uh, research and uh, development budgets of these major companies, how that compares to the field? That's the first question. And the second, um, a lot of assumptions in this field build on this notion of a rather open world. And over the past years, um, of course, with the war, with the pandemic, a lot of talk about sovereignty in Europe and elsewhere. How do you think it would influence your growth perspective as a startup, as well as your valuations, if from tomorrow onwards you could only sell and produce here in Europe? Yeah. I think for a second question, maybe we start with Jan. I think it's a good one for you. I think. With the second yeah. question? Well, you the first if you want as well. But I, think I, don't, the I don't have any fine. numbers for the first <laughs> question that I could, um, that I could say I don't know if I understood the um, the second question actually correctly so is it what we can do in Europe to grow further in the future no no I think it's more if uh, there were strict uh, yeah if, if sovereignty was to put some bounds on what you're kind of allowed to do res restric uh, restrictions to export for example to some countries uh, would that have an impact on your valuation on your growth perspectives on the way uh, the company could become a global leader that's it Okay, I, I got it. Um, uh, well, I think that's an interesting topic. I mean, there is at the moment no strict regulation uh, for quantum computers. It is being discussed in the background and there are some forces that want to pull quantum computers onto certain lists um, to, to regulate it. Um, my personal opinion is that it's too early. Um, because, I mean, this is then about dual use and other things, and I think it still needs quite a lot of systems to make any dual use happening. Um, but of course, for us as a, um, as a startup, which has a business model to sell systems at the moment, it is important to reach a certain market, right? And okay, you can start with, with Europe, but then we are, of course, also thinking beyond Europe. Um, and I think it is very important um, that we are able also to sell outside of Europe. I'm not sure if, if uh, everyone would buy from us. This is a different question. Um, but it is also so that when I talk with the policy makers, um, except when you're now maybe talking about very specific countries, actually they would allow us to sell, um, which is which is good. And I think it, it would be great to see such kind of deals happening um, in the future because yes, in some aspect, valuation of a company is also related to the market that this company can reach. So I think if we put too hard boundaries there, we will somehow, yeah, limit um, the development of, of certain companies. Yeah, and I think to add to that, so for maybe for those who are not really into valuations and fundraising, etc. But essentially, if a company like IQM or Pascal or others wants, they want to raise hundreds of millions, which they will need to go to commercialization at, uh, and scale up. Uh, I mean, they need to 
convince the market that the valuation uh, is high enough that uh, they can raise this kind of money. If there are limitations and they cannot compete, I think definitely that would be a challenge for them uh, to raise as much money as competitors from the US and from elsewhere would and have the same restrictions. In terms of your first question, um, at McKinsey, we've actually done some um, estimates around what the what the investments are, and you find the exact numbers in the Quantum Monitor publication we, we've just released. But um, we are talking probably about several hundred millions invested by each of the um, uh, the big companies, um, IBM, Google, um, probably significantly more than Microsoft so far. Yeah, but um, they are also putting in significant money now. Yeah, and. Uh a question for uh, for Robert and Laura, actually, that uh, building a little bit on that, uh, on the, the, the companies in the US in particular, and referring to one that's called NVIDIA. Uh, in particular, they're doing uh, GPUs, uh, supercomputers. I think you see them in HPC centers. Uh, and Robert, you've announced some collaboration with them as well. Uh, how do you see collaboration work uh, going on between you and these companies, between quantum computing, European companies, uh, and these large multinationals? It's smooth, is it, are there restrictions? Is it a challenge? Uh, is it uh, easy, complex, needed? Uh, needed, yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, the, the landscape is is so rich right now, and there are so many different approaches that are being taken that it would be ill-advised to lock down into any one particular direction. So, I mean, as an HPC Compute Center, you know, we entertain all, uh, all interests, evaluate them, see what works best for the portfolio that we have and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, to your point, is it harder? That's a, that's a good point, because the one thing that I've noticed is that it is challenging sometimes to work with American companies over here and to because um, you know frankly there's a little bit of a divergence so that we're not going that way we're staying European centric which is com I completely understand that to build the ecosystem and I 100% support it uh, sometimes when there is interesting technology and capability to be had being able to utilize it over here is somewhat limited. So that does make a difference. Um, something like NVIDIA, of course, uh, with their globalization and, the, and, their, um, and their approach, that's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, we, we definitely utilize it. There's simulators coming in. That, that's really encouraging, too, that when GPU, when you know from my space, from the HPC space, are heavily looking at the quantum, they're already thinking about how to integrate in. They're making things a lot easier because they're, they're going with this approach already. I totally agree. It's, it's uh, as easy as with European company, <laughs> if we put it that way. Uh, no, the only issue that we have is that we are working with teams that are in the UK. So it's more with Brexit that we have to deal rather than uh, with uh, French-US uh, relationship. Uh, it's needed because there are, unfortunately, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, we, we lost the CPU and GPU battles. And QPUs are not going to be standalone machines. Uh, that's not what I think. So we need to have both. Um, and therefore, we need to work with them. Um, when it's going well. Okay. Uh, so we have three minutes left, if I'm not wrong. So one question here. Thank you. Um, uh, Silke Hahn, I'm a tech editor from Heise. I actually have a question for Jan Götz um, concerning IQM. I don't know, perhaps I missed the point, but what actually made you found your company in Finland? Um, yeah, that's a good good question. Um, so when I was after my PhD, I moved to Finland to do a postdoc. Um, so I was more on a scientific track, maybe towards some professorship or so. This was maybe the the goal there. Um, and um, usually, the way it works in science is that you do your postdoc here for two years, then maybe there for two years, and and then maybe you find something interesting. Um, so I was working in in the labs of uh, Professor Mikko Mötten, and, and when my two years were over, so to say, we sat down and thought about, okay, what can we do and it was then a point where we realized okay quantum computing is meanwhile at the stage where it's not anymore only about developing certain elements of the computer but it's really about building a complete system out of it and um, this kind of system engineering um, doesn't happen in universities usually and the good thing that we had in Finland um, for example that I haven't seen in so many other places is an ecosystem argument um, so in on the one hand side we need these low temperatures for the superconducting circuit 
markets. And low temperature is something since the 60s is being developed in, in Finland, actually the market leader for these machines. Whenever you see these golden chandeliers, the likelihood is good that it's actually a Finnish company, Blue Force, that builds them. So there's a very strong ecosystem on this side. And then the uh, micro and nano fabrication as well. I think for a hardware company like us, we need to have access to fabrication lines because I cannot buy in, with my first investment rounds equipment for hundreds of millions. It just doesn't work. So they have actually a, a state-operated clean room, which is open for startups, and we pay the um, equipment by the hour. And this is in then a business case also for an investor. And this is something, um, at least so far also here in Germany and elsewhere, I haven't really seen that, um, that clean rooms are offering this kind of thing. So it was really a unique opportunity there. And this was then paired with the team. So we, we were four founders and we all said, okay, now it's the right time. So I think it's this combination of having infrastructure, some IP as well. Um, so during my time here in Munich, I didn't file a single patent application. During my two years in Finland, I, uh, I don't know the exact number, I filed several. So it's a different mindset on the IP and then the team. So it was just this unique combination in the end. Yeah. And I might add to that, I think the, this idea, for this point of having a combination of several things at the same time, that's why you have uh, great companies like uh, QM being born. And that's why also uh, we're missing, I think, some opportunities, I'm pretty sure, in Europe when, when you look at my curve, because you don't have everything at the same time time. You have uh, academic founders who are interested, but maybe nobody wants to be the CEO, wants to take the lead, or you don't have an ecosystem and you have to pay for your fridges, which are a million each, so your investor is not super happy with uh, with doing that. Uh, this and that, I mean, that makes a huge difference. And I think uh, from our perspective as an investor, I think that's something we'd like to see more, ecosystem level activities and governments in Europe, I think they tend to uh, underestimate the impact. And so they fund technology, which is great, but they don't fund ecosystems. Uh, or with very limited amounts of money. And I think that's a challenge and I hope something in the future would change. Okay, uh, so I think we're done. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending today and I hope we convince you that, yeah, things are not that bad in Europe after all, in quantum. Uh, even maybe we could take a global leadership there and I'm sure uh, all of us here uh, uh, around this round table, table uh, will do our best to make this happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>